got a bigger podium since the last time I was here. I see. I'm Bernard, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I always say, y'all lighten up. I'm not talking about y'all tonight, I'm talking about me. So, so it's going to be all right. But I always like to read something out of the big book. Um, first of all, I'd like to say again that my name is Bernard and I'm an alcoholic. Um, my sobriety date is uh, September the 5th, 1994. Uh, if I don't die or get drunk between now and then, it'd be 21 years. Now, that may not <laughs> impress none of you, but that really, really impresses me day by day. Because for me to stay sober that long is miraculous because I was one of them guys that I never could get sober. And I came up here in the Alcoholics Anonymous up under many different uh, things I called on my back problem. Wife on the back, job on the back, girlfriend on the back, no money on the back, or everything on your back. And I came up in here and the only thing I wanted was to get stuff off my back. But what I came in and when I first humbled myself and I was willing to do something different, I came in and I found out that I was given a new freedom. I was given a new happiness. I had got to a place in my life that I no longer regret the past, and nor do I wish to shut the door on it. And I have comprehended the word serenity, and I do have peace. And that doesn't mean that things don't go right in my life or go all like I think they should go. The point of the matter is, is that Alcoholics Anonymous has shown me a new way to live, and it had given me a different action pattern toward life that I can go through anything one day at a time through this program in a relationship with a loving God and with the hip of the people of Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm gonna read this here. It's coming out of the AA traditions. It says, to those now in this fold, Alcoholics, Alcoholics Anonymous has made the difference between misery and sobriety, and often the difference between life and death. AA can, of course, mean just as much to unaccounted alcoholics not yet reached Therefore, no society of men and women have ever had more urgent need for continuous and effective and permanent unity. We alcoholics see that we must work together and hang together, else most of us will finally die alone. And that's why I'm here. Because of the unity and the fellowship and the belief of the people in Alcoholics Anonymous, knowing and understanding that there was people here for me when I first came in. And they told me that any time someone asks me to do something, I need to do it. And that's why I'm standing here, because I know that the only way I can keep what I have is to be able to give it away. And the, the, the trick part of that is, as long as I continue to keep giving away, I continue to keep getting. So I never stop giving. And, uh, and I'm, for that, I'm eternally grateful. But anyhow, I started my drink at age, uh, first of all, I have no idea of what I'm going to say. Not one. Whatever comes out, that's it. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and I took my first drink at age 14, that MD 2020. Uh, that uh, stuff they call Mad Dog. Uh, I don't know about the Mad Dog, but I tell you, it made me throw up everything from the age 14 years old uh, to the time that I was born. And that's when I started making promises with God. You know, if you let me get up off this one, you ain't never got to worry about me no more. And uh, I told that lie for 23 years until I came in this last time. It took me five treatment centers, two halfway houses, and many, many times going to jail before I got sober. I was one of the alcoholics. I thought I just had bad luck. You know, I thought all good things happened to everybody else. But you know, what seemed to be the problem that everything goes out of the window for me? What seemed to be my problem? You know, why, why does it seem like that? I'm always got to be the lowest man on the total pole. You know, why is it that when situations and circumstances come up, why everybody always got to leave me? Why the police always got to come picking me up all the time? You know, uh, they, they, they know that somebody out there probably doing a whole lot worse stuff than I'm doing. Now, that ain't saying I'm getting DUIs, I ain't working, I ain't paying nobody, I'm stealing, and I'm doing all this stuff. But I'm pissed off with the police because they come picking me up all the time. <laughs> you know, I wasn't responsible for anything. You know, I remember I was writing more bad, I had more bad checks than the government did probably. Because <laughs> that's what I do. You know, I hear people come up here talking all that stuff. Look here. 
when I'm on, I'm on. Ain't no turn around the next day for me. It's all in for me. And I'm not no just come back the next day guy and talk about that slip. I don't do no slipping. I do some wrecking. And if you're in the way, you're part of the process. And, you know, and, and, and that's just how I operate for me. But, you know, when I was coming on up and I started back drinking again at age 16, I started drinking like I did in the beginning at 14 because I drank three big water glasses of uh, that MD-2020, that mad dog that I was telling you about. And back in the day, uh, they had that red rooster and the Wilson and all that. Some of them old school guys know what I'm talking about. They had all that kind of stuff, and that's what I used to drink. And, but I started having seizures around 16, 17 years old. And when I started having that, I was realizing that at that young age, I was doing a lot of drinking. I was an All-American basketball player. Probably could have done something good. Uh, I wanted to be an Air Force fighter pilot. That went out of the window. I wanted to be a state highway patrolman. That also went out of the window. Alcoholism stripped every single thing away from me. Most of all, it took the self-respect and dignity from me as a human being, and it reduced, reduced me to an animalistic level. I found myself laying down, sleeping, and being around with people that I never thought I'd be around. I come from a good family. I was raised up for nice stuff. I was used to having nice clothes. I was used to living in a night. I used to having nice things. Alcoholism curved me to the point that it took every single thing away from me. You know, and for a long time, I hated God with a passion. But when I was growing up, you had to go to church. And if you didn't go nowhere else, you went to church. And I remember this particular day, I did not put my money in church. I went across the street after church and bought me some candy. So uh, that evening, I was playing uh, softball out there in the yard beside the house. And when I slid on second base, there was a broken Pepsi-Cola bottle in the ground. And it almost cut my leg off. And uh, right then, I knew God was after me because I didn't give him that little change in church. <laughs> See, I had alcoholic thinking when I was young. <laughs> and, and I knew he was after me. And for many years, I lived like that because I remember coming in here in Alcoholics Anonymous and y'all got signs on here and you talking about for the grace of God and, and I'm going through the period of hell. What grace you talking about? Then you come up in here and you got stuff on the wall talking about some think, think, think. And then you're going to turn around and tell me don't think. Then you're going to talk about all of this other stuff. And I'm like, y'all people don't understand. And let me tell you something about y'all alcoholics here. Come up in here and you're going to tell me one drink get me drunk. Do you realize who I am? <laughs> y'all don't know who I am. Do you know how much I drink? Do you know her other chemicals I use with alcohol and I come up in here and you're going to tell me one drink gets you drunk? Well, y'all some weak drinkers. <laughs> you know, but see, I didn't understand. It wasn't all up. It was the first one that got me. See, you know, I, don't, I don't get killed by the caboose. I get killed by the engine. Because once I start that cycle, it's on. And I like what it says about alcoholism. It says alcoholism is a physical allergy. Coupled with a mental obsession in which a spiritual void. The physical allergy is that I get weak, my body break down, and I also break out in some stainless steel handcuffs. <laughs> yeah. And all other kind of jewelry they put on you, they hold you like this. <laughs> the, 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 the mental obsession is once I put it in, it's all bets is off. I can't tell you where I'm going. I can't tell you where I'm in and up. I can't tell you what I'm going to do. I can't promise anything. Only thing that I can tell you, get out of the way. <laughs> That's the best thing I can tell you. You know, and my mind was racing a thousand miles an hour, and I can't hold a single thought. You know, it's a shame that, that for me as an alcoholic, I was hunting when I had it. I was hunting when I didn't have it. And I was hunting before I could finish using up what I had. So therefore, I can't even enjoy what I'm doing because I'm so busy searching and trying to get more. But nobody else ain't never done that, huh? <laughs> okay, but I keep talking to you then. We'll get real in a minute. <laughs> you know, and I operated like that for many years of my life. And I never could understand what seemed to be a problem. You know how the big book talked about we are such unfortunate? I thought I was a such unfortunate. I never could understand what was wrong. But I never at one time looked at saw that alcoholism was my problem. I never one time got honest with my condition. 
It took me five treatments on two halfway houses and many, many times going to jail before I got sober this last time. You know, I went to the meeting so many times, they wouldn't even hug me no more when I go to the meeting. <laughs> I was like, boy, you need to start doing something different. You know, and then them old timers sitting up in there and, and they calling me boy, but I realized why they was calling me that boy because they was trying to protect my anonymity. That's what they were doing. Them old timer, good old boys sitting there with the laid back, they smoking cigars and they sitting there smiling, talking about the AA program work and they telling me to keep coming back and my life is miserable, it's all outdoor. And I'm sitting up here wondering, you telling me to come back? And then you know what y'all alcohol never got to tell me. Come on, you love me. You don't even know me. You don't know where I'm coming from. You don't know what side of the track that I come from. I ain't never seen none of y'all over there. See, I came up in here with all bias and prejudice ideas, thinking that I can find a new way of life. And at the same time, I wasn't even getting honest with my own self. So it was real easy for me to sit back and pick and choose and talk about what y'all ain't doing and not really taking a look at my own self. But I remember that night very vividly of September the 5th, 1994. For the first time in my life, I fell down on my knees and I asked God to help me. And when I fell down on my knees and asked him to help me, there was like a calmness that came over me. And even though that I was still full of fear. Because, see, there was many times I wanted to die. See, the only thing I wanted God was to do is to get stuff up off my back and allow my life to go on so I could continue doing what I wanted to do. But that didn't how it works. I had to come to a place in my life that I had to totally surrender. Because when I came in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous this last time, you know, I was ready. I was weighing about 125 to 130 pounds. I weighed 205, take 80 pounds up off me. I was a dead man walking. Most of all, the deadest thing on me was my insides. There was a pain on the inside that's indescribable today. Webster doesn't even have a dictionary, the word in the dictionary to fit the pain that I had. I often say that if I cut off both of my legs and drop me in a bucket of gasoline, I'm quite sure that the pain wouldn't be that great as it was on the inside. And I had to come to that place of that moment of clarity that they always talk about humility. Humility for me is nothing but understanding and having the clarity of the reality of my life and humbling myself and be able to do something different. That's what that is. And until I got to that point and was willing to do something different, I continued to keep doing the same thing over and over. And then they were expecting, I got different results. I went to different jailhouses. <laughs> I went to different shelters. I had one alcoholic tell me one time, he said, Darren Bernard, he said, every time I carry you home, I take you to a different address. <laughs> I ain't had no house of my own. And I remember people were talking about, well, if you don't have no house or nothing with your name on it, you're home. I ain't home. I stay with my mama. <laughs> Maybe y'all home. I live with my mama. <laughs> you know? And see, that's the insane thing that I had. You know, and I always came up in here and I sit around and I look at y'all and I pass judgment. And I was never willing. See, because I come up in here and I thought it was funny. I thought it was a game. I thought I'd come up in here and run some of them same street games on the people up here in Alcoholics Anonymous. But yet and still, they already knew what I was doing. And a lot of times I thought that I was hip, slick, and cool that when I came in that they gave me a little something. I didn't realize that they were giving me a little extra something for they know that I had to run my course. But in my sick mind, I was thinking that I got over. And I came in here like that. But one of the things that I'm a firm believer of are the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, even though that I was going in and out and I was going through all of them hell, the people of Alcoholics Anonymous were still helping me out. They were still telling me, come on, Bernard, you can do it. Come on, Bernard, I'll take you home. Come on, Bernard, we'll do this. They continue to keep taking me even though that I was falling short. And now that I'm sober, I pray to God that I don't never get so self-righteous because somebody else is not getting it like I think they should get it. And then I turn my back on them. Well, if they had turned their back on me, y'all would have a different uh, individual up here tonight. It wouldn't be me. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. And I'm one of the alcoholics that I was brought up by the good old boys. You know, I went up there, you know, they would come in and they would tell you that, that, you know, this is what we do, Bernard. Get you a cup of coffee, sit on the front row, be quiet. We don't want to hear nothing you got to say. 
I get pissed off. Who y'all think y'all talking to? Y'all don't know me. Don't tell me. Be quiet. I got something to share. What I got to share? I ain't read no big book. I ain't done no step. I don't even know what a sponsor is. I ain't done nothing. All I did was come up in here and I rest on my laws. And I find myself one day when the crisis of life comes up to me. And then I don't have any program to deal with it or relationship with a power. And I find myself back at that crossroad or that jumping off place. And I ask myself that favorite question. How did I get here then? What seemed to be the problem why everybody else continue to keep getting it that I can't get it? What seemed to be wrong with me? What makes me so different than everybody else? And I remember many days cursing God. For the simple reason, because it was the same old thing all the time. Every time it seemed like I get a pair of shoes, a shirt to match up, two dollars in the pocket, some woman to smile at, and I forgot all about why you're here. Now can't nobody tell me nothing no more. Now I got the answers. Now my high power in her. Now she gone. <laughs> now I'm drunk again. Now I'm right back at the same place. Asking myself the favorite question. What went wrong? What happened? Our book tells us that our real reliance depends on God. It tells us also in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous that we don't apologize for God. I don't. Because if it wasn't for the grace of God, I wouldn't be here. Because I know it's only by the grace and mercy that I'm here. I understand that through that grace and mercy, that he allowed the people of Alcoholics Anonymous to be able to change their life. To be able to, so I can be able to see some of the grace that they have. Then maybe they have something to do on something that I may want to have. Because my life is all messed up. You know, they told me the greatest example of life is not so much in what you say, but in what you do. You know, and I call myself and consider myself as a con artist. I didn't know nothing about living life. All I knew was about destruction. You know, I was 37 years old when I got sober this last time. I had three jobs in my entire life that I had, had for a year. See, you know, an alcoholic like me, I go get a, I don't go no, get no full-time job here. I go get a part-time job at the temporary sale because they don't care whether you come back or not. See, because I'm the kind of alcoholic that when I turn on once again, like I said, I'm on. So I don't do no working. I don't do no eating. I don't do no sleeping. I don't do none of that. The only thing I do is drink and do what I do. That's what I do. And I know today that if I do that, I'm a dead man. But I was telling my friend as we were coming up here, with my luck that I have, I live and go through all that hell again. That's just the kind of luck I have. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I read that. I didn't come here just for me. I came here because there was people that came in here and came long places for me when I came here. And now that I have got a little time, now I need to start giving back. And that's why I'm here. It ain't because I'm the greatest speaker in the world. It ain't because I'm the greatest guy in the world. I'm only here because I'm a recovering alcoholic that lived one day at a time, by the grace of God, hadn't took a drink in a while, have worked some steps in my life and be able to be of service to somebody else besides my own selfish and self son self. That's why I'm here. You know? And I learned that from the old times, and they told me, they say, if you can't add anything to anybody's life, you leave them alone. You don't have a right to turn down another individual life. People that went through hell enough in their life, and now all of a sudden you come up here because you got a little time now that you think that you can just snatch the rug for bump under people and play with their life like you got it going on? This is the way I talk. I told you I was sharing my experience in strength and hope and what happened to me. And y'all got to excuse me the reason why I talk like that. Because I got my, my mouth is a little sore. So that's why I keep doing this. And, 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 and that's how I got here. And that's the way I was taught. Because they told me that everybody's lives matter up in here. That you would be able to find a new freedom. That people would be able to have a place to go. To be able to be. And I need to be of service so that I can be able to be there. But you know through that process of coming up. I remember that I was walking out there in a blizzard. Snow this high on the ground. I ain't got no money. I'm walking downtown. Sleep, rain and stuff. Trying to get something else to drink. Remember time selling the tennis shoes off my feet. Walking down a two and a half mile highway with 15, 20 degrees. 
outside and I just paid $120 for them. And I sell my tennis shoes off my feet for about 15, 20 bucks. Now I remind you, I told you I come from a good family. But this is where alcoholism curved me. It curved me to a place that was beyond my comprehension and imagination. It curved me to a place that I was being around with people that the pictures on the wall had turned infested because they were so infested with roaches. And you had to stick your fingers in your ears to pray to God that won't nothing crawl up in the ear. See, this is where alcoholism curved me to. It curved me to that derelict place, that last run. I probably had two cheeseburgers in the course of the four or five days that I was out there. I had nothing. You didn't need no x-ray machine to look at me. I look like them people on Ethiopia. The biggest thing on me was my kneecaps and my head. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you come in here, but I, I wanna, you want a pretty sight for me when I come in here. And I was hurt. I had never felt a pain that was so excruciating on the inside in my entire life. Now, the trap door fell down many times, but it was just one particular time of that moment of clarity. But I had to go through all of these things that I had to go to to be able to get to. And the only by the grace of God that I'm standing here not dead. I should have been dead a long time ago. And I thank God that life ain't fair. Because if life were fair, once again, y'all would have somebody else up here tonight. It wouldn't be me if life was fair. But see, I didn't realize that coming in and humbling myself and surrendering myself, miraculous things started unfolding. When I started working the steps, and I said earlier about having that new freedom and that new happiness. Not being able to regret the past, no wish to shut the door on it. We were comprehending the word surrendered and no peace. And no matter how far down I went, I would see that I would be able to be of service. See, because an alcoholic like me to live the kind of life, I, I don't deserve to do anything. But there's grace and mercy that be upon me, upon coming into Alcoholics Anonymous and surrendering myself and being able to ask him for help. See, I don't know about y'all got here. I come here, I was ready. It won't no pimping no more. Pimping was over. I tell people all the time, all players need to understand that they get played too. All players. So don't come up in here and alcoholics and normal trying to be a player. There's some crazy people up in here. <laughs> they may look good, smell good, and got a little skeet ski on and stuff like that. But there's some crazy folks up in alcoholics and normal now. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> oh, y'all know I ain't lying. <laughs> You know, so, so I need to come up in here and I need to be a service and be able to help somebody. You know, because I never helped nobody. It was always about take, take, take. It was always about Bernard, always what I wanted, always what that. But then when I, when I like what the book says on the last page, it says God will constantly disclose more to you. See to it that your house is in order and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. The great event that come to pass for me is that I got a place with my name on it today. Another great event, I got a car, driver license, and insurance on it at the same time. <laughs> That's a great event for me. <laughs> I've been holding a job for a few years now. That's a great event for me. I got a host of friends that I never dreamed possible. That's a great event for me. My mama even let me in the house. That's a great event. I don't know what great events for y'all, but they are great events for an alcoholic like me have lost everything. I lost every single thing. I drank my wife up. She been gone 30 years. She ain't back yet. Y'all think she coming back? <laughs> she, she ain't back yet. She gonna tell me one time, talking about she gonna leave me. You can't leave me. If I can't leave me, you can't leave me either. <laughs> Cause hell, I wanna go just as bad as you do. <laughs> No, I'm going to leave me. No, uh -uh. we're going to ride this together. <laughs> you know, but I remember all of them things. But see, this reminds me of a little story. I hadn't told it in a long time. And it was about a bird named, I, told, I don't know why. I just come in here and share a message of hope with y'all. And have a good time. Because we're not a gloom lot. We've been miserable enough. Now it's time to live. Now it's time to get some happiness. Now it's time to get some peace. Now it's time to get some joy. 
Now it's time to get an understanding of, of who I am and like who I am. I don't need folks to validate me today. I have a relationship with God. I like me today. And for many years, I hated me with a passion. But see, for me coming in a program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I found myself like Chippy. And Chippy is a little pearl key. And, 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 the, and the lady, she loved her pearl key so much that she had Chippy in a cage. So this particular day, she decided that she's going to clean out the cage, you know. And so when she got ready to clean out the cage, she used a vacuum cleaner. So when she got the vacuum cleaner, uh, cut it on, she stuck it in there, and when the phone rang, it startled her. And when she swung around like that, Chippy was sucked up in the vacuum cleaner. Chippy don't know what's going on. All of a sudden, he's laying here cooling out. Now he all sucked in. <laughs> so now she says she loves Chippy, so what Chippy all dusting and everything? Chippy don't know what in the world to happen. Now she's gonna take Chippy and clean Chippy off. She cut the faucet on, the faucet cold water, and stuck Chippy up under the wall. Now Chippy just really done lost his man now. Now he's sitting out there one day in peace. Now he find himself sucked in and washed up. Oh, but that ain't the end of the story. Chippy need to be dried off. <laughs> Y'all know where Chippy going, right? <laughs> so now, now Chippy already hysterical, you know, and now she said that now she needs to dry Chippy off. So now she go get the uh, uh, hair dryer. So she go get the hair dryer and she sticks it to Chippy. Oh, Chippy just really distraught now. How did I find myself one day where everything in my life seemed to be all right? And I find myself sucked in, washed up, and blown over. Y'all ever been there? So they asked Chip, she asked, they, the reporter heard about it, and asked Chip, asked her, said, well, how is Chippy doing now? She says, Chippy don't sing like he used to sing no more. <laughs> Chippy just sits and stares. <laughs> the good news is this. Oftentimes in our lives or in my life, it was like Chippy. Everything was fine. I found myself sucked in, washed up, and blown over. And the sweetest song or the innocence that I had in my heart was taken away. And I found myself one day sitting there, stern, wondering what happened in my life. How did I get here? No fault of my own, but how did it get here? How many, I wonder, has their mindset or their lifestyle was like chippy? I didn't wake up one day and say, well, you know something? I think I'd rather be an alcoholic. I think that's a very good career move. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I really think that I can just go out and I can have a wonderful time being an alcoholic. It would be wonderful. Wouldn't, as, the, as it says in, in the book, wouldn't it be grand? <laughs> no. But what happened is, is there was a program called Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous does not hide me from life. It gives me a direction through life. And that's why I come to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, because I was like Chippy. And I come up in here, and y'all helped me restore that song, that sweet innocence that I once had many years ago. By coming in here, accepting the fact that, that I was powerless over alcohol, and that my life was unmanageable. And came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. And when I understood that then, I saw how things were going, so I made a decision 
to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood it. And then I was willing to make a searching and fearless more of inventory of the good and bad and realize that people had a place uh, wherever they was just like I had a place wherever I was. And they did the very best that they could as well as I have to do the very best that I could. And what the steps did is stopped me from blaming and got me to take a look and realize that there's a lot of other things that goes on in the world and not the worst thing always happened to you. There's a lot of worse things that happen to other people as well as it can happen to you. Matter of fact, there's a lot of people that's dead and gone that's probably a lot better person than I was. So it's only by the grace of God because by the grace of God that I'm here, that means I got a chance. And I'm a firm believer that anybody that come up in the Alcoholics Anonymous and have not taken a drink can be able to lose the desire and be able to find a new way to live one day at a time. I'm a firm believer of that because I'm a living witness of that. You know, I went through pure hell in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I know what it is, you know, not to have anything. I know what it is to not to be able to eat. I know what it is to not be able to have a car, or insurance, driver license, and all that at the same time. See, I'm one of the alcoholics. I had to lose every single thing I got, but everybody doesn't have to do that. That is not a requirement. That was Bernard's requirement. And the only reason that I'm still here is because somehow, some way, there was a grace and a mercy that was put upon me that allowed me to be able to be here. And that's why I'm here. And I was raised by women. They say women can't raise a man. I believe that's a lie. Uh, my mama raised a good man. What happened was is that I made a decision to do some things on my own that had nothing to do with my mama. You know, because I was raised good, but I made them decisions and I paid the price. I often say that whatever decisions that I make, I need to understand that I need to be able to live with it. You know, I don't need to cop out, but one of the good news about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is that it had allowed me to have a program. That when I do make mistakes and when I do come up short, is that I be able to have a way that I can be able to rectify it. I can be able to work on cleaning it up. I don't have to duck and hide and always look over my shoulder and run. I can admit my faults. I can admit my wrongs and be willing to do something about them. You know, I believe the character defect, you know, and shortcomings. I think a shortcoming for me is nothing but a character defect that I'm not willing to do anything about you know, I remember times I used to tell the old timers, I'm not perfect. Well, I know that, but that's not an excuse to do the right thing. You know, and I had to learn that the hard way. Oh, I, I still make mistakes today because my mistakes and some of my weaknesses is my greatest strength today. Because I understand that. And for a long time, I didn't understand that. And the only way that I got that is through working the steps. It's working with a sponsor. Because, see, when I got sober, I got sober with them good old boys. They don't ask you to do nothing. They tell you what to do. They're going to carry me to uh, Old Fort, North Carolina. <laughs> to a damn bluegrass festival. <laughs> what did that look like to y'all in a bluegrass festival? <laughs> what did I look like in a bluegrass Ain't nobody in there like me. <laughs> Up in Old Fort, North Carolina. But let me tell you something. And I often tell this story, and I tell this story for a reason. You heard me say earlier that when I came in with all my bias and prejudice issues, well, when I come into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, that has to go. There's no way in the world that I can reap the benefits that I reap today if I continue that same mentality. Because I don't know who's going to help me up in here. I don't know who I'm going to call. I hear sometimes people talking about, well, I ain't going to call. But you don't know who you're going to call up in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and who's going to be able to be there. We are a bunch of people that normally would not mix, but we are a bunch of brothers and sisterhood that's undescribable that the world does not understand. Where else can you get that that you hurt and people call, you can call them at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and they'll answer their phone. I pray to God I never get too good that another alcoholic called me that I am too busy to pick up my phone. Now all of a sudden I got good now. Call me at a certain hour. I remember when you didn't have a phone. <laughs> now, now, now I'm so important now. The only important thing that I need to understand is that I only have a daily reprieve. Contingent of the maintenance of my spiritual condition. That's what I need to understand. And keep the truth about who I am as an individual. 
and realize that no matter how long I've been sober, that I can still fall off just like anybody else can. You know, and I ain't confused about that. And that's why I come to meetings. And y'all keep hearing me talk about keep coming. The reason why, these are things why I come. See, because if nobody else in here stays sober, I can stay sober. You know, I hear me, we're talking, coming now. Sometimes they talk about the, the newcomer is the most important person in here. That's a lie. I'm the most important person in here. <laughs> I'm the most important person in here. Yeah, I got time, but guess what? I can get drunk just like the new person. I'm not immune from getting drunk. So when I come to meetings, I come to meetings for me. But if I can help a new person along the way, I don't have a problem with doing it. But when I come to meetings, I'm the most important person here. You know, because I know for a fact, in my own experience, that I should have been dead as many times that I go back up out of here. You know, and I'm not confused about that. And that's why I do what I do. I came up here, I ain't have a pot to piss in on one of the throw it out of. Now I come up here and I got a suit, a shirt, a pair of shoes to match up, and all that good stuff today. Matter of fact, I got something with my name on it. Ain't that shocking? Now I don't know about some of y'all, maybe some of y'all had stuff. I ain't had nothing. I lost everything I had. I had to lose everything to gain something. That was a hard pill to swallow, but that's a reality. Sometimes I have to lose the most important thing to me to get my attention. To let me know that, hey, you can do nothing without me. It's only by grace that you're here. You ain't got it going on, Bernard. It ain't about you. It's about me. And it's about what you do to serve and help the people. That's what it's about. But in the long term, you get some of the benefits as well. And that's why I'm here. To keep what I have. And I'm very selfish with it. Because I don't allow anybody to put an umbrella over the sunshine of the spirit. I tell people all the time, I be one of the happiest, cleanest, brokenest mother hopper you ever seen. I ain't got to, and it don't depend on what I drive. It doesn't depend on what I wear. It doesn't depend on who I hang out with. It depends on everything about the program of the Alcoholics Anonymous and the loving God. That's what it depends on. And the promises. I remember the promises. In the big book they would talk about either God is everything or he's nothing at all. I heard an old timer say that one time. I thought it was, I thought it was something, uh, he just, it was just magnificent the way he said it. God is everything. Hell, I didn't realize it was in the book, so I read it. Because I didn't pick it up and read it. It talks about that one of the greatest things to keep man into everlasting ignorance is contempt, pride, investigation. I always talked about what wouldn't work for me. I don't know what would work for me. Had you tried it, Bernard? No, I know me. No, you don't. If you did, you wouldn't keep getting drunk. If you did, you wouldn't keep doing the things that you're doing to keep causing you problems. So obviously, you don't know. So I had to always be open. But back to that little story up in old Fort North Carolina. And I went up in there and once again, ain't nobody in there like me. Nobody. And I don't have a problem with telling it. Because I don't understand sometimes when I go to places to, to share my experience, strength, and hope. It's a lot of time, I'm the only one in there a lot of time. I know I ain't the only black drunk in North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I told you, I'm going to tell it. <laughs> but it's the truth. It's the truth. But I keep coming. Because it's not about the color of the skin. This is my message I'm trying to get. It's not the color of the skin. It's not about who they are, where they come from. It's about what do we do together as a unit and be able to stay sober. That's why the book tells me that I need to lay all my bias and prejudice issues to the side. I need to lay it all. But then with the good old boy, we went up there, and then they, they in there clogging. <laughs> I ain't seen no club I went to that they clogged in. <laughs> I don't know where y'all might have been, but ain't none where I've been. They ain't going to tell me we going to the club. What club? But let me tell you something. When I walked through the door, I said, Lord, 
you must have a real good sense of humor. <laughs> Tell you how the working power of God in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. When I walked in there, them people treated me as if I had been coming there all my life. I had one of the most best times that I have ever had in my entire life at a darn bluegrass festival. <laughs> oh, I couldn't wait to get back to tell it. <laughs> I tell people all the time, them little ladies, they had on them little white shoes and look like they had metal caps on them or something. I don't know whether two by sixes or two by eights or whatever they were. Had a little man, he's sitting up there in the chair, looked like it had about two, three strings on it, and another one had a watch. Oh, they were working out. I tell people all the time, and when you're going to do some clocking, you need to get in shape. Because <laughs> them little old ladies, boy, they was working out. And I always tell this story to let people know that may be new or used to be like I feel when I first came in the door. Open yourself up and allow the miraculous or the miracles of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and people that normally you would not mix with become closer to you as a brother, as a friend. Because for many years, I missed that. Coming up in here, passing judgment on people, not wanting to listen, think I got it going on like somebody owed me something, I would have missed it. And that's why I tell these stories. Because I know I'm not the only one that came in Alcoholics Anonymous and felt that way. But I'm here today to say this. Anybody that's in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous today does not ever have to drink again one day at a time. I'm a firm believer of that. I know today, if I go out and get drunk, it has nothing to do with the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's because Bernard have a desire to do his own thing more than he have a desire to want to work the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and have the faith and belief in the relationship with the God. Because the book tells us, once again, our real reliance depends on God. It don't depend on my sponsor. My sponsor is fallible. He can fall and get drunk just like anybody else. I hear people sometimes talking about a light bulb. Well, hell, suppose I get up there and take your light bulb, what you got? Oh, here's a tree now. Well, hell, suppose I take your tree. Then what you got? I had to find something that was bigger than me that nobody couldn't touch. And the only way that I can, the only way that it would lead me if I decide to give it up. And I don't choose to give it up today. Because miraculous things still continue to fold in my life even after being here as long. And I, and I understand today that I am all right with me today. I'm all right coming up in a place of fellowship with Alcoholics Anonymous and being able to talk to people. I don't care whether I know you or whether I just met you. I consider everybody that comes in here as a brother and a friend. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I don't care who you did it with. I don't care how many times you did it. What I want to know is how can I help you and what you want to do about your problem? That's my, only, that's my only thought for that. And that's the way they treated me. And I need to treat other people the same way, to let them be able to go through what they had to go through because they was willing to be able to stand up and tell me about myself. They was willing to tell me the truth about myself. They weren't willing to allow me to go out and wreck myself. They told me the truth, even though if it did hurt me, they told me the truth about it. But I'm going to tell my little story and I'm going to go to my seat. Uh, I might have told it before, but I'm going to tell it again. It was this farmer, and this farmer had a goat. I told y'all I got sober with the good old boys now. <laughs> Everything I got come from the good old boys. And he had a goat. And everywhere that he went, he would always take his goat with him. So this particular day, he decided that he wasn't going to take his goat. So he tied his goat up in the back, and in the back there was an old dug well. And, in the old, and, and so he went up there, and he came back. He found out that he didn't see his goat. 
So over the period of time, he heard a noise and he walked over and he looked over in the old dug well and he saw that his goat had fell over in the well. So he went back to the barn and he got all kinds of ropes and pulleys and things and whatever he tried, he could not get the goat up. So he went back to the barn and he got some shovels and things and he was throwing dirt over in the hole. And as he continued to throw dirt over in the hole, the goat was shaking it off and packing it under his feet. And as he continued to throw dirt up in the hole, the goat got up and it just walked out. The point that I like to tell that story is that's what the 12 steps of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous does in the 12 tradition. Is that what I do is I have a sponsor. And as they continue to work with me, and as I continue to strip the stuff down with inside of me, and I shake it off, and I use it as a foundation, and I become the man that God will have me to come become. I become to be able to build a relationship with God as I continue to rise. So I always try to pattern my life behind the old goat. It's that I like to shake things off, and I like to pack it under my feet. And as I continue to keep doing that things like that, I begin to get better as a person. The promises begin to come true. That's because I'm cleaning up. The more I get cleaner, the higher I go. That doesn't mean the higher I go. That doesn't mean that life don't happen. People still die. You still get fired off jobs. Uh, everything else still goes on. But the good news is, is that I have a new motivation for living. And I got a different action pattern toward life. And no matter what happens in life, I know that I'll be all right one day at a time through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's why I'm here today. I'm here because I've learned a new way to live. They say keep coming back, you'll learn more. So I keep coming back. They say keep giving away, you'll get more. And I keep coming back and I try to continue to keep giving. And as I continue to keep giving, I continue to keep getting, you know. And, and that's why I come here all the time. And that's why I keep talking about the way I come back. From. So that message to anybody that's new up in here, keep coming back. Don't quit. It's real easy to quit. And it's hard as hell to come back. So if you're here, don't keep coming back. Just stay. <laughs>